Welcome to today's Commonwealth Club presentation. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Reilly, and I will be the moderator today. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Darla Dixon. Dr. Dixon is a licensed psychologist presently working as a trauma-informed care coordinator for the California Department of State Hospitals. If you have any questions for Dr. Dixon, please use the text chat feature. And as time allows, she will answer your questions at the conclusion of her presentation. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Dixon. Trauma-informed care um, is really about um, ensuring that we all have the best experience possible in our workplaces and the places that serve us. Um, and it's, it's an approach that organizations can take um, to acknowledge the impact that trauma has on individuals and as members that are operating within this, the system. Um, let's see. So there are some real, some very basic tenets of trauma-informed care that uh, an organization following this approach is going to, to take. And the first is realizing that the impact of trauma is widespread. It's not just something that happens here or there, but um, when one in four women will have been a victim of a sexual assault by the time they reach adulthood and one in five men, um, there's a 20 to 25 percent chance that either you or someone you know has been affected by that type of trauma. But there's all kinds of trauma. And so kind of just recognizing that trauma exists and there are paths to healing and recovery um, improves our, our ability to relate to one another, to have um, workplaces and treatment areas and schools and jails and all the places we go that are filled with kindness, dignity, respect and autonomy. Um, being able to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, like what is it um, that someone's communicating to you through their behaviors um, when we're talking about our, our family members, our clients, our staff, our supervisors, um, and being able to read those as adaptations to some difficult situations changes the response that you give. And when your system is able to be responsive to the effects of trauma on the people that they serve, um, then we can resist re-traumatizing one another and we can all move forward. Um, and so we wanna consider the context in which trauma is addressed or um, treated that's gonna to contribute to the outcomes of trauma survivors. Um, and so this presentation is gonna give an overview of trauma-informed care. And we're gonna do it by following the stories of three people. Um, and these are, these are real people, um, real experiences. I've of course uh, taken some liberties, um, but sometimes it's easier to, to understand a concept when you can actually relate to the experience that someone's had in it. And so the three people I wanna introduce you to are Samuel. Um, he's a 17 year old high school student. He's at a school for children who have behavioral or emotional difficulties. Um, he's kind of a businessman. He's got an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, if there's a problem to be solved, he's gonna solve it. And hopefully for him, it'll work out in his favor. And then there's Donna. She's 65 years old. She's a, an administrative assistant at a convalescent facility. Um, she's a mother of four children who are all adults. She's been married 40 years and is a strong advocate for herself and others. And then of course we have Richard who is a 50 year old disabled veteran. He's a father of two. Um, people would describe him or his family would describe him as protective, generous and good with his hands. And each of these people are, are going to be encountering um, some situations that maybe um, were not necessarily um, uh, caused by, um, you know, the, the, they'll, be in, they'll be in a circumstance where the situation could go good or it could, um, there's going to be some room for improvement. And what they bring to the situation and what the situation brings to them um, is going to show where trauma-informed care comes into play. Um, and so Samuel, uh, again, he's at a school um, after he's been suspended. Um, and he this is not his first meeting. It probably will not be his last. But um, being 17, uh, he's got some feelings about um, how this is going to go and what to expect. His family's there, his principal's there, counselors. It's a big meeting. It's a big meeting. Um, Donna has been dealing with some um, issues with coworkers at uh, work, and she's going to be bringing the those situations to the attention of management. 
And we have Richard, who has been hospitalized with a terminal illness. And um, I think, as most of us have experienced, being in the hospital during the last year has been an exceptionally stressful um, situation. And we're going to see um, how these situations turn out, what impact they have, um, and what impact the situation has on them. And perhaps you can imagine yourself as we go, go through these, um, these circumstances. And um, one of the things I do want to cover before we get started, you know, we have three different people with three different experiences. And I can imagine, um, I would guess, like, as I was describing some of these circumstances that we're going to be uh, walking through, um, that you probably had some of your own feelings and some of your own thoughts and some of your own expectations on how those types of situations would work out, have worked out for you, your family. Um, and a lot of that has to do with who you are and how you see the world. Um, and that's the important thing about trauma is it is something that uh, affects who we are and how we see the world. Um, and SAMHSA took some time um, about in the early 2000s to define what is trauma because there's lots of definitions depending on what field you're in. Um, and they basically settled on it um, as being represented by three E's. Uh, the first E is events. When you're in an event or a series of events or a circumstance, um, that you experience, the individual experiences as um, physically or emotionally harmful um, or life-threatening, then this is an event that has the potential to be traumatic. Um, and when those events that you live through have lasting impacts, lasting effects, that's the third E, on um, your emotions, how you think, um, your physical functioning, uh, your social functioning, you know, the relationships that you maintain, when that happens, that's that makes an event traumatic. Now, not every event that we live through is going to um, cause a major wound. Um, often we uh, pull on our resilient um, skills and we move on. Uh, but sometimes when things happen too much, uh, too long, or just um, get us at a time when we're just not at our best, um, then it can lead to trauma. Um, and really 70% of us will go on to um, be just fine after an event, but 30% of us could be at risk of um, developing PTSD. And it's not uncommon to be faced with these types of situations. Um, and these situations, while they seem like, okay, a discrete event, um, they, they have a major impact on us overall. Um, and we know this in part because of a study that was done um, back in 1998 by uh, Felidi et al. They worked at Kaiser and they were trying to help people lose weight. And they kept finding a lot of people would lose the weight and then just put it right back on. Kind of sounds familiar. It's hard to break old habits, but really, was there something more to it? And yes, there was. Um, they took a look at um, the experience of particular um, events during childhood before the age of 18. Um, and that includes things like physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, um, witnessing uh, violence between your parents or, or your caregivers, um, having a caregiver or parent with substance abuse or mental illness, um, going through separation, divorce, having a, a household member incarcerated. Those are all things that can drastically change the course of, of your life, really. And there are also things that are not, not uncommon. 30% um, of the respondents, um, about 30% said, yes, I had those things happen to me in terms of emotional abuse. Another 30% um, had uh, separation, divorce, or substance abuse in the home. Um, and so, and these, these are things that have remained pretty constant over time. So from uh, 1998 to 2014 to even today, these are this questionnaire, the adverse childhood experience is continuously administered and these results tend to be the same. And the thing about it is, is when you're exposed to these things, when you're learning how to navigate the world, then that's how you learn to navigate the world essentially. And you, it, it changes the way that your brain works. It changes the habits that you have. It changes the thoughts you have and expectations you have for yourself and others. And then that also plays a role in what um, behaviors you decide to do, what behaviors you decide not to do. So if um, your home life is um, pretty uh, difficult and you wanna be a good student, but 
you really find um, the kids who are over here not going to school who also have difficulty and have learned to deal with that by skipping school or doing drugs or, or whatever have you you're gonna you're gonna take that path for however long that works for you um it, or maybe you just throw yourself into school and you neglect all kinds of other things and maybe you take up you know smoking to deal with that um, these behaviors that you adapt then also affect how likely you are to be exposed to things like um, um disease, disability, uh, and eventually, you know, how, how close you'll be to death by the time you, you become an adult. Um, and so it's really important to consider um, your experiences and how you've adapted to those. And now let's go back to um, Samuel and Donna and Richard. Um, and so on the, and let's see, there, there are A scores, which is the adverse childhood events. It's essentially a on average, how many of these different classes of events you've been exposed to. And their, their three E's, let's see those in, in process or in these moments. Uh, we have Samuel, who, again, he's at a school meeting. Uh, it's not his first one, again, not his last. Um, the second, uh, an administrator mentions, you know, what happened or um, the expectation. He, he kind of jumps to a conclusion. Um, and his response is, what, do you want to expel me? I'm leaving. So he's, he's, he's getting out of here. Um, his expectation, regardless as to what the administrator was going to say, was that he's not wanted here or he's not going to be successful here. And so um, that's the way that he experiences the world. It may or may not be true, um, but that's going to create some anger. That's going to create, especially being 17, you know, the desire to kind of protect his ego and save face. Um He's got an A score of six, so he's lived through some things, and it, it makes sense that for him, he's going to try to, um, he's learned to um, manage the situation as quickly and as, as best he can, which may or may not be the best thing. Um, and then we have Donna. Um, she's trying to address this concern, how she's being treated, um, whether or not she or her fellow employees are getting a, a meal break. Uh, and let's see, so her response, um, she, she receives a response from her managers, um, which isn't um, necessarily uh, as productive as she would like. And her experience of that is what's wrong with asking for a meal break. Um, it was like a tide broke. She just wants them to follow policy. So now she, she made her effort to, um, to handle this in a way that she thought was best. Um, and it, it didn't work. Uh, and perhaps she even received some backlash and now she's feeling anxious, hypervigilant, unsupported. Uh, she's got an A score of two. So it sounds like she's had a lot of experience um, navigating the world and has had uh, a lot of probably more opportunities than say Samuel's got an A score of six to develop those skills to do it in a healthy way. Um, and now we have Richard. Um, he's hospitalized and they're requesting um, that he participate in some, some tests. But again, he's, he's terminally ill and he doesn't know what's going on. And, and that's reflected in how he responds to them, asking me questions. He's afraid, he's confused, um, he's alone. Um, and he's got an A score of nine. Um, and so he's had to adapt to quite a few things. And then you also, um, if we consider his military background, um, it's entirely possible that, you know, his likely response is one of withdrawal uh, if he can't fight. Uh, and so um, there's another element to their response that I wanted to cover, which is essentially the part that we don't really have a lot of control over. I mean, we can work on it for sure. Um, but our brain is a huge factor in driving our responses to um, situations that we perceive as safe or dangerous. And the thing about that is, is we don't come into the world knowing what is safe and what is dangerous. We wait for the world to tell us and we wait for the world to tell us how to respond. So if you're in a home where there's um, uncertainty, um, chaos, um, not a lot of uh, predictability or safety, then, uh, or if you're exposed to a lot of toxic stress, and that's like a, a lot of um, unhealthy stress over time, then it, you start developing the skills that you need to survive that, which means that your um, brain's gonna be very quick to react. Um, you're gonna get used to um, being in a fight, fight or freeze um, state. Uh, and so, unless you have someone or until you have someone who or some ones who can come to you and say, no, uh, this is how we can restore a sense of safety. Um, then 
your 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 default response is going to be more responsive to that stress. Um, and so as you're developing and you're, you're building on that framework, then that's kind of um, what's going to inform how quickly you, you'll be to respond to a threat um, in a way that's um, based on feeling uh, or, or, or not, if you've learned to push all your feelings aside as a matter of survival. Uh, but in short, the, the more often you have a response, so say, for example, um, let's say that Samuel's uh, parents fight a lot. Um, he's learning something about um, anger. And if every time someone gets angry, they yell, then he's going to learn when you're angry, you yell. And then the more he sees that, the more he does that, the stronger that response is going to get. And then that applies also to things like fear. So in this case, he became afraid and his reaction was to get up and walk away. Um, and that's like an automatic response and the automatic response is going to feed the beliefs that we have. And so I just want us to keep that in mind as we're considering each of these, these three folks. Um, as I mentioned, Samuel, like he is most likely to, um, persist in an opportunity. So if he says he's leaving and the door's open, he's going to go, he's going to, he's going to flee unless and until he has to fight. Um, Donna she's she'll negotiate she's like i can i can handle this situation um she probably has more um has developed her ability to stay in a more regulated state and can try to she can try to work things out until it gets to be too overwhelming and her um sympathetic nervous system takes over and then she moves into a freeze response which would be that um anxiety that we were talking about and richard i mean soldier through and through he's going to fight um, unless he's incapacitated. And when we're incapacitated, then our, our free system kind of kicks on because it's like, well, have you ever seen a, a cat and a mouse um, uh, playing a game? Well, from a cat's perspective, it's a game. From a mouse, it's a matter of survival. But um, the, the moment where the mouse looks like he's dead and the cat stops playing at paying attention, then the mouse can, can uh, flee. And so in that case, freezing is something that's really helpful. Um, and so here we have Richard, who's been... Um, uh, well, he's developed his ability to fight, but in this case, there's only so much fighting he can do. Um, now, they're, they're going to provide their responses, and here we have the system responding to them, and how the system responds has the ability to transform that interaction to one that's an incident or more people are being hurt emotionally or physically, or to a, an opportunity where there's gonna be some healing, some relearning of um, habits so that we can be more adaptive in our responses. Um, so Samuel, he runs outside, immediately he's surrounded by many staff, including an armed officer. Um, Donna, um, she continues to experience anxiety at work until finally she, finds another way to address her concern, which is to go and file a complaint with an oversight agency. And Richard, um, he's developed a good family support network. And so he calls his daughter to, um, to uh, help him interface with the nurses. And let's see. And so, and I'm sure you probably have an idea as to how you might respond to each of these situations. And, and what this means to you. And when you kind of think back to the different people, the different places you've been that have, a, have made those more likely, then that's, those are the areas you want to look at when we're talking about being trauma informed. And in these cases, um, Samuel uh, was fortunate enough that his family member was also there and they all have a pretty good relationship with the school. Uh, and so his, his family member was able to, to take him off campus um, and help him calm down and come back and resume the meeting. Um, Donna carried through with her complaint and her agency was able to make changes that were um, directly addressing her concern. Uh, and so she gained a sense of empowerment from that. Um, Richard, um, with the support of his daughter, uh, was able to um, offer the opportunity for the nurses to take blood. Um, but they weren't able to get any because he was too sick and the nurses um, uh, listed his, their, their inability to get the blood as a refusal. Um, now, when we're looking at, uh, I'm going to go back to the, the, um, 
the agencies in a moment, but when you, when you look at each of these different responses and how each, um, each agency kind of, or each person in that situation approached or didn't, um, what was the response to each of these questions? Like, did they, were they able to see the strengths in um, the people who they were working with? Uh, being able to connect a patient to the family when um, you need to help them communicate with, with you, um, that's, that's a strength. Um, and so instead of asking what's wrong with you, what's wrong with you, why don't you just let me take your blood? Um, you problem solve and look at it from a different perspective. And understanding that uh, the symptoms that we see, you know, the angry Donna at the office, um, the, the receptionist who's maybe a little bit rude, um, those, those are behaviors that serve a purpose. Um, and they may not be like specifically, um, they may not make the most sense to, to us as the person witnessing it, but those behaviors came from uh, whatever this person has had to do to adapt and survive. Um, does it make it okay? Not necessarily, but if I understand where that's coming from, then I can understand why it's there. Um, and I can, I can give a response that's going to work. So when the school says, Hey, uh, sister, mother, brother, can you go talk to him? Um, he's afraid of me. He thinks I want to attack him. Then that's being trauma informed. And that's going to lead to, uh, to change for both the student and the school. Um, but it's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, and when we're talking about having a trauma-informed system, we're, we're talking about the employees, we're talking about the uh, executives, we're talking about everybody that works at the agency, kind of understanding what it is. And when you um, are at any of these, these places, like uh, a school, you're, you're, you're touching the lives of um, humanity when they're developing. And so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to help shape the world. Um, when we're talking about places like um, the doctor's office, the hospital, um, or a community center where you're serving um, well, people who are who need to help, whether it's you know to um, be able to engage in some extracurriculars or help in terms of like managing daily life, um, you want to be able to hear their voices. You want to be able to consider their needs and understand that. And also, you also want to look at the needs of the people who are doing the serving, the people who are within the agency, because if the nurse who wrote to him down as, uh, uh, who wrote Richard down as having refused, if she is on her second double because there's not enough staff, um, then and she's also the one that gets tapped to, to work with the difficult patients. I mean, her cup might also be full. Um, and we're kind of setting her up and the patients up for a pretty difficult situation. Um, and so we want to be able to be informed. We want to know who we're serving, who are the people we're recruiting to serve, um, and take into consideration um, what each person can bring to, to make sure the situation works out for the best and to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing people that were providing pathways to healing, that we're hearing uh, what they have to say to inform our policies, our procedures, our practices, um, so that um, we can have the, the best outcomes. And at its most basic level, when you're being in trauma informed, you are using these, these six principles. And if you don't remember anything else, this is really the, the easiest part, um, is trying to align your behavior the practices you enforce, the the culture which you have in your agency. If you can align them with these six principles, then you're you're most likely to have success. Um, the first is safety. Um, that's the first thing that we need when um, when when we're trying to you know exist in the world. If we're not safe, uh, we don't have a basic level of safety. Then we're we're going to have a hard time doing doing our jobs. A hard time. Um, getting the things we need, being effective. And that's not just physical safety. It's good. Yes, I have a roof over my head, but do, emotionally, do I feel like I can come to you and say what it is that I'm, I'm thinking or feeling without being hurt or attacked? Um, that's that's the, one of the foundational uh, principles and probably one of the biggest ones. Um, trustworthiness and transparency. Uh, when you've lived a life where people haven't been trustworthy, you often um, expect to have to 
overcompensate for what someone else is saying that that may not be true. So it's, it's, do you do what you say? Do you mean what you say? Are you, or do I have to prepare to be disappointed? Do I have to prepare to take care of myself? Do I have to prepare for something that's unexpected? Um, peer support. Uh, we're all peers in COVID. I would find it hard to believe if you took a room of a hundred people that not one of them wouldn't know someone who either had it or, um, someone that that lost or, or knew someone who was lost to COVID over the air. Like we all know what that's like. And so we can uh, share our experiences. We can offer ways to move forward together. Um, and it's kind of like when you're talking to your teenager, you can tell them all kinds of things about whatever the issue is, about how to do, do the dishes correctly, about how to uh, maintain a relationship. But it's not going to be until they hear it from their their best friend, whose mom told them the same thing last week that they're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense to me. There's something about hearing and learning from someone who's been through it. Um, that makes it, um, it makes the information credible. And it lets us know that someone actually like truly understands where we're coming from. Um, and of course, uh, the next one is collaboration and mutuality. So if we're all working together towards the same end, then we all also have to know what role do I have to play? Is my role valued? Um, and we all have a different role to play. Like when it comes to healing trauma, you don't have to be a therapist um, to be therapeutic. When it comes to providing a safe environment, um, how you're greeted when you come up to the reception desk at your doctor's office, I mean, often people lose patience over that. Um, and knowing, hey, I'm here, we're here, we're all gonna solve this, this one problem. And uh, you also have to acknowledge in that process, like what are the power dynamics in that situation? Um, I'm a psychologist um, and just having the title of doctor can be intimidating for some people. Um, so if I don't keep that in mind and welcome people when, in their opinions, when we're, we're sharing or problem solving, then someone's voice may get left out. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that my supervisor, you know, isn't in charge of me and, and shouldn't, you know, correct me. It just means that I honor, I acknowledge that, hey, this is what your role is. This is the power that you have in the situation. And that I, as one holding the power, I'm not going to abuse that. And if you come together to do a group project with, with someone, with a team, um, can all voices be heard? Do we have the skills? Do we have the knowledge? Do we have the opportunity? Um, and so you want to empower your, your workers, empower your, your, um, uh, the consumers, the sh any shareholder to be able to say what it is that um, could contribute to the path of healing. And this is not without um, uh, consideration to the fact that we all come from someplace. Um, based on how we look, people respond to that. And that has a lot to do with our culture. Um, that has a lot to do with historically how we've been treated, um, our, our sex, um, our disability status. Um, we all exist in a context. So when I come into a meeting, they're not just seeing Dr. Dixon. They're seeing uh, Darla, the woman who's black, um, who is, um, uh, well, potentially, I'm not sure what class they judge me to be, but um, those, those three things alone are going to bring in some assumptions, some biases, some stereotypes. We all have them, but we do need to acknowledge them and understand how they're working within us, within our agency, um, with our, our clients, with anyone that we're interacting with so that we can account for those dynamics as well and um, ensure that our policies or procedures are um, supportive of advancement and responsive to those needs. And if you're, you're following these six principles in any setting that you're working in, you're going you're gonna to see some results. I mean, and it's going to take time, but some, some agencies have been able to do it successfully. And when you see it working in schools, there are significantly less behavior problems from students. Um, and it may not be just that the students just magically decide, hey, we're not going to we're not going to break rules anymore. We're not going to fight. No, it's people's approach, the approach of the teachers, of the disciplinarians, of the counselors um, are creating a culture in which 
fighting maybe is not necessary, stealing is not necessary, or the suspension itself is not necessary. Um, there are other ways to solve the problem. There are other ways to capitalize on these learning opportunities. Um, and the foster care system, child welfare, there are fewer um, reentries, like families stay together more often. Um, when you're talking about secured facilities like um, psychiatric hospitals um, or prisons, jails, uh, it's, it's safer. There are fewer restraints, there's less staff turnover, um, there's fewer assaults, um, and just in general, uh, our, our physical well-being is, is improved. Um, you're less likely to have symptoms from uh, any traumatic events. Um, you're less likely to find that your employees or um, consumers are engaging in substance abuse. Like all these things go down when we're able to account for uh, the trauma that we know that we've experienced. And again, it's not just the consumers that we're considering, it's, it's also our staff um, from the janitor all the way up to um, the people who, who write the policies. Um, so if you're interested in implementing a trauma-informed approach, there are several things that you'll, you'll, need, to, you'll need to do. Um, the first is to slow down and, and take a look at your, your organization. You look at the culture, the policies, the procedures, who's in power, who doesn't have power, um, how are things decided? And, and this look needs to be an honest look. Um, we can all be 100% in favor of having an environment with psychological safety, um, having an environment where we want everyone to speak up. But if when um, John speaks up at a meeting, um, if later everyone is um, suddenly not talking to him for sharing his opinion, then that's not safe. And if we don't acknowledge that, hey, this is a thing that happens here, uh, then you're, it's not going to get it addressed and it's going to get swept under the rug. And it really, that's, that's would be working completely against uh, your goal. Um, but when you find you have practices that are consistent with the principles, then you want to enhance those and you want to find out what's making that work. Um, and then you want to prepare to address all the policies, practices, and, and cultural elements of your agency that don't fit with those principles. Um, and one of the most important parts of that is ensuring that everybody has the training um, from Nurse Nancy to um, Randy, the receptionist, to um, Edward, the executive. Um, everybody needs to understand what it is and how it fits in with their role. Um, our, our HR folks, um, often they, they may say, hey, I don't, I don't know why I need to know this. Like my, I don't have trauma. The people I serve, maybe, maybe they have trauma, but we refer, refer them out to, um, uh, to get therapy with um, uh, our EAP program. But also that process of coming back, that process of filling out this paperwork to um, address what just happened to them or why they were gone, that process can be uh, difficult. And if we take into account um, what elements of this fits into TIC trauma-informed care and which doesn't, then it, we're going to have a better employee experience. Um, yeah, so ensuring that everybody knows what it is and then really taking the time to sit down and revise the policies and procedures and practices that um, drive the culture, that drive decisions. Um, uh, for example, if your agency is uh, has a, a uh, I'm sorry, a, a what is it called? A, a, a system where you promote people based on merit, but you look around and all the people who have been promoted look the same, then there's probably something that's happening uh, amongst your policies and procedures that probably needs to be addressed. Like maybe the people who get brought to the attention or, you know, friends of the people who are already in the office. And so maybe that's something that needs to be um, accounted for. Um, but there, there's, there's a, a lot to, um, there's a, a lot of different ways to go about implementing trauma-informed care. And there are a lot of resources that uh, we have access to um, that will allow any system, any agency to, to become, or individual to become more uh, educated about it. Um, and so here are some resources that you can use. Uh, again, SAMHSA um, is a really good resource, this, and that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. They've published a guide 
um, where they kind of, they basically outline what it means to be trauma informed and, and provide some tools for uh, getting there. Also um, the university at Buffalo's School of Social Work, they provide a really comprehensive guide for implementing trauma-informed care. And Trauma-Informed Oregon is an agency that's been doing this for quite some time. They have many resources on uh, the nuances and minutia of trauma-informed care. Um, and so thank you. Um, I hope that wasn't too fast, um, but I do want to, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and welcome um, uh, Dr. O'Reilly back. I learned a lot of valuable information from this talk. It was excellent. And I do appreciate your agreeing to speak on this, especially during a work day and in a morning to boot. I do have a few questions for you. Um, sure. There were a couple of questions on child bullying, but um, they were very similar. So I'm going to read one of them. All how, right. does, how does being bullied as a child negatively affect how an adult sees herself or himself? Sure. Um, and really, that can depend on a lot of different factors. Um, but in short, you know, if let's say the bullying is happening at school um, and usually it's with a, a peer group. Right. And so um, what kind of support that child can get around that bullying? Like, do they feel like they have people who they can go to to solve the issue? Um, is the system responsive? So, for example, if um, let's say your, your child is, is Charlie and Charlie goes and says, hey, um, these boys are bullying me because uh, I'm not athletic like them. Um, and if the school goes, OK, that's cool. We'll tell their parents. Bye. See you later. And he's left to deal with it on his own. He's going to take away some information about that and how he decides to move forward after that. Like, does he confront the bullies? Is he successful? Um, is this something that's lasting just over the year or is it something that is the entire school year? Um, all those things are giving him messages about who he is and how he fits into the world. Um, and so if there's no supports, if when um, he goes to, to seek support, like he's unheard, um, or even if he finds a way to solve it by maybe like aggressing against these kids, like he's going to learn what works for him. He's going to learn um, uh, how he should be when he's with these other people. Um, and so in short, if, if there's not enough support, if there's not enough education, if the culture of the school kind of supports that, and if it's the same thing at home, um, then yes, that, that could have an adverse impact on him. But if the school can capitalize on the resources and the resiliency of the child and of his peers and of his family, uh, then that could be something that that works out um, in his favor. Maybe he learns how to negotiate. Maybe he he builds up some strengths to um, manage difficult situations. Or maybe someone helps reframe the situation for him so that he can see uh, the different qualities of these children who are choosing to to treat him this way, um, and kind of separate that from his sense of identity. Um, and so, in short, yes, bullying can have an impact. Um, and that impact is going to depend greatly on many factors, um, including just to add one more, including including his development. If this is a third grader, uh, that's going to have a different um, range of impact than, say, if this is a, a 15 year old, a, a ninth grader, where they're developing their identity around um, uh, where, where the information that they receive when they're in public with peers plays a pretty big role in um, how they see themselves moving forward. Whereas a third grader uh, may be more flexible uh, and may draw more information still from, from home and from other, other peer groups. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. I think yeah. you, I think you, <laughs> you summed the two questions up really well. Somebody yeah. else wanted to know who has gotten, uh, has received psychotherapy in the past, individual psychotherapy wanted to know, mm -hmm if group therapy would be helpful for greeting, greeting uh, for treating trauma or post post-traumatic stress disorder. And in what way would that be helpful? I think the person is considering doing it. Sure. Um, it's kind of, I think one of the, the elements of healing is peer support. Um, when we are able to hear uh, how others have walked the same path that we're on, then we feel more comfortable sometimes moving forward. 
Um, and there are lots of different uh, curriculums that people can use when it comes to addressing trauma. And, and just to, I do want to take a moment to kind of clarify, um, being trauma informed necessarily isn't necessarily like a trauma protocol. That's um, one aspect of trauma treatment specifically. Um, and, and there are lots of different uh, uh, protocols that we use in therapy to address trauma that can be adapted for groups like cognitive processing therapy, where um, you are um, considering your, your thoughts, um, you're kind of writing things out to see, uh, to kind of break that link between what happened then in the past and what's happening to you now. So your body can learn, know you're safe and every trigger you run into doesn't have to be, um, you know, a call to, to arms. Um, so it's cognitive processing therapy. There's trauma focused, uh, CBT. Um, yeah. So in short, there, there are many different, um, uh, trauma protocols that are applied to group settings and, and group settings are often a very helpful, um, format or forum to uh, address trauma because often trauma survivors may feel like they're alone um, and may feel like that maybe no one understands. But when you can access um, the, the other level of this is when we're in fight or flight, one of the things that gets turned off is our ability to relate to each other because, um, or to others, because we're, we're busy trying to survive, but being able to pull yourself down into a regulated state um, helps that healing process along. And when you're in a group, you have a, a lot of other relationships to draw on when you're doing the work that you're, that is going to lead to healing. And so um, when you have more supports, um, then that's one avenue that really strengthens and um, enhances the healing process. And so uh, for those reasons, I, I would, I would recommend uh, group therapy, but of course, you know, you would want to try out the group and see if it's something that works for you. Okay, thank you. I believe that uh, the uh, cognitive processing therapy was developed in the VA for uh, combat veterans. Is that correct, or did I hear that incorrectly? Um, I can't say for sure. I, I kind of want to say that you are correct, but that's just a a a feeling rather than a fact that I know. Uh -huh. Okay, and um, here, actually, you alluded to these in your last answer, but. But what are the physical health concerns of long-lasting trauma? What will that, how does that affect somebody's physical health? Yeah, absolutely. So when we're exposed to trauma, um, our sympathetic nervous system turns on and it, it, it excretes um, a stress hormone, uh, cortisol, which um, changes things like our metabolism. It changes our ability to sleep because why sleep when we're searching for danger? We got to keep our eyes out, right? Um, and so you, you put yourself at risk for, um, or when, when there's all this ex excess stress in your body, you put yourself at risk for things like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, uh, let's see, uh, obesity, um, um, fatigue, um, and all those things impact the quality of your life, um, difficulty sleeping. Uh, changes in your, the other thing that happens is your, your, the things that you don't need turn off. We don't need to eat. Right. And so if you're not eating properly, then, uh, your body's not getting what it needs to regenerate, restore, heal. Um, and so all those things can come together and, and yes, have an, an adverse impact on, on your health and your, your well being. Um, and, and that also includes your, your mental health. I mean, I know people like to kind of separate, um, our, our, uh, psycholo or psychological health from our physical, but they're, they're intertwined. It's, it's, it comes from your brain. Um, and so, uh, you're more at risk for depression and anxiety, um, when, uh, you're, you're not taking care of yourself physically. Um, so, uh, th those would be examples of some of the health okay. conditions that arise when, um, you're subject to a lot of un uncontrolled stress. Okay. Well, thank you. That's a good answer. Uh, somebody else had said that, uh, She'd been badly traumatized as a teenager. It doesn't elaborate on what the trauma was, but now she's in her late 30s. She still remains, uh, well, the way she described it sounds like hypervigilant. She's uh, very aware of somebody walking closely behind her. Uh, even a colleague comes by her desk and just taps her on the shoulder and makes her jump. What, is that common? And what would be the treatment for that? Yeah, so what you're talking about is hypervigilant. Uh, our hypervigilance. Um, um, and I was talking a little bit about um, 
how when we when, when we are going through a traumatic event, one of the things that's happening is um, our brain is focusing on the things that could lead to uh, harm. And it stops normally when we're going through our, our day, we're just, you know, taking in the environment um, without necessarily taking like big notes. But we have a hippocampus, which is our, our memory center and our amygdala, which is our feeling center. And when um, there's a threat, the amygdala takes over and gives the pen to the amygdala and says, hey, write these things down and or to the hippocampus. And it says, don't you ever forget them. And the hippocampus says, yes. What do you want me to write down? And the hippocampus, uh, the amygdala, is not is not a super sophisticated um, uh, part of our brain. It was it's one of the first parts to develop, um, and it, and so it's very very basic. So if let's say um, someone's going to come into my office and attack me, I have this red curtain here. I have a red blanket there. Maybe my amygdala is going to say red. That's dangerous because when that person attacked me, there was a lot of red everywhere. And so now whenever I walk around. Uh, my hippocampus has dutifully made a note saying, hey, this is dangerous. And so when I see something that's red, it's going to trigger that response. Um, and my amygdala is going to go, good job, hippocampus. I'm going to keep it safe. Right. And I'm going to have this unnecessary reaction. Um, and it's a, it's a false alarm. And it's perfectly normal because that is your body's way of keeping you safe. The thing is, is it doesn't know it doesn't have to do that. Um, and the thing that usually leads to that stopping is um, taking the time to teach your body that, hey, this is actually not a signal of danger. We do not have to be hyper vigilant. We do not have to be worried all the time when a friend taps us on the shoulder. We know them. They're safe. And the way to address that is to essentially expose your brain to many opportunities where that's happening, but you're noting and learning that you're safe by having a safe, calm body. Um, and that's something that can be achieved through, uh, through therapy, um, through um, exposing yourself through the, to those situations in a, in a graded fashion. And so things like EMDR um, or um, uh, um, Sorry, I'm forgetting the, the name of it, uh, but um, uh, exposure, um, exposure therapy, those types of therapies help decrease those responses. Thank you. I'm going to lean over for a second. I have to plug in my computer, but I, I, can, I can still hear you. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned exposure therapy. Is that, is that gradual? Is that graded therapy rather than just confronting them with what it is that they're particularly afraid of? Or is it just mental? Do you know? Yeah, so I mean, a formal exposure therapy, um, sometimes with response prevention. Um, give me one second to stuck this, plug this in. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Okay, yeah, so um, I apologize for that. Um, uh, that's okay. Yeah, so exposure therapies, typically one of the things that you, you usually want to be able to do is to relax your body. Um, the formula essentially is relax body plus threat. Uh, right now it, it equals, you know, stress, but eventually you keep doing that and then it's going to equal calm, but you have to have this skill down, the ability to maintain a relaxed body or to, or relax enough to endure the stressor so that your, your brain has the opportunity to realize, oh, I'm not dying. I'm not being hurt. Um, and so a lot of therapies will typically um, build up your ability to, to tolerate that level of stress first um, before exposing you to that. Uh, but um, but really, um, it's just the opportunity um, for your, 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 your mind to be exposed to the situation um, long enough for that stress response to, to kick in. Okay. The, the, the anti-stress response. So usually okay. it's, uh, usually most people do gradual because um, let's say I have a client come to me and I'm like, okay, so what we could do is I could teach you these skills real quick. Um, and then we can just jump right into it. Most people go, no, we need to slow down. And so um, that, that's usually what happens, at least with, with me. I won't speak for other therapists, but yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. I think that answered the question. And I know you covered much of this, uh, uh, but another person just had texted just to know what sorts of, of, of treatments, I guess, uh, therapeutic uh, mod modules have been found to be particularly successful with deal dealing with trauma, uh, as the person said, for dealing with PTSD. 
Yeah, so that would that would be any type of exposure therapy, uh, cognitive processing therapy, and um, uh, EMDR. Those are those are probably probably some of the, the top therapies that people use to address um, exposure to trauma. Okay, thank you. And anxiety. And if I remember correctly from what you said earlier, the cognitive processing therapy is ideally done in a group setting. Is that correct? Uh, you can do it in a group or individual setting. It's been adapted for groups. Okay. Um, EMDR, would, uh, which is eye movement, um, uh, desensitization and reprocessing therapy. That's typically done in an individual setting. And then um, exposure therapy is usually done in an individual setting, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you can also do that. Okay. In and since I noted in your introduction that you're doing this for the California State, um, this is my question, the California State Department of uh, California State Hospitals, can you just spend a couple minutes talking because <laughs> that's a lot of people. Uh, yeah. What what's been uh, what's been set up in in the state hospitals to deal with trauma? Because clearly the people in the state hospitals would have suffered significant significantly uh, bad experiences. So can you just spend a few minutes talking about the trauma informed care system in the state hospitals? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and so in the state hospitals, I mean, you have a wide variety of um, patients who are there for help. Um, and a lot of them, especially in the forensic hospitals, um, a lot of the patients have come from uh, oh, prison or jail. Um, and usually that's not the most safe place. Um, they often have histories of trauma, which are pretty significant. And then you also have our staff members who, um, um, usually most people who are drawn to fields like medicine, social work, um, the, the healing arts usually have some sort of um, events or series of events that kind of push them to want to help people. Um, and so you keep that in mind and then kind of layer on um, the interaction between our patients and our staff and the fact that we're all coming from um very different environments that we've had to navigate and learn how to adapt. And some of the adaptations have been, um, you know, challenging enough to, to land them in a setting like, um, you know, a state hospital. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a very, it can be a very delicate um, situation. Um, and so with bringing trauma informed care to the state hospitals, I would say that the goal is to um, help everyone, um, increase a sense of physical and emotional safety for both staff and patients um, to, uh, and, and, and that includes like decreasing incidences of uh, violence, um, increases, um, increasing uh, participation and progress in treatment. Somebody who's suffered from severe trauma, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual, how, how do they, how do they build back their resilience from such a, a horrible ordeal or somebody who grew up in a, a remarkably abusive childhood, somebody been, been in the foster care system and now is 20 years old. Uh, how do they reclaim their resilience? And I see yeah, if you can well, answer that in three minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I would say that they, they are resilient. Um, if you've had a horrendous childhood and you've made it to adulthood and, you know, you have relationships or have shown the ability to build relationships. Um, if you are motivated to move forward, like you have strengths, you have resilience. Um, and it's a matter of kind of capitalizing on those. And while you also work to build up yourself in the areas where um, uh, you, you've had to learn some uh, ways to adapt that, that haven't been healthy. Uh, and so one, I do always encourage people to do therapy, even if you're, you're not, you know, um, suffering from the, the worst afflictions, because I think that's, that's a element of, uh, mental health or, or mental, um, you know, protection for our brain and for our minds, but also, um, things like, uh, doing movement, uh, so exercising, doing yoga, running, um, finding ways for your body to express itself. Um, taking opportunities you can to, to, um, let your mind relearn because we're always learning. That's the thing. We're always learning and we learned how to survive trauma. And now, 
uh, you can always learn how to thrive without trauma. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. That's good, so, yeah. That's yeah. a good answer. I think you're, I think that's a great, yeah, I think. You know what? Uh, uh, it was a delightful talk. Very informative. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. And I want to thank you again for agreeing to do this. I know it's a big project, but we have run out of time. So I hope everybody who's watching this, including you too, Dr. Dixon, has a wonderful remaining, remaining part of the day. So goodbye to everybody. Bye.